Hi, welcome to the uh, lecture series on the landscapes of the Netherlands. Today we will be discussing the landscapes of the Low Netherlands. We've been discussing the landscapes of the High Netherlands, which is everything over one meter NFA. In, uh, that is not Southern Limburg. There will be a, a video on Southern Limburg by itself. Um, we will be discussing the Northern Marine Deposits today as of part one of the landscapes of the Low the Netherlands. The second installment of this lecture series will be um, on the peat landscapes, which will come right after this one. Right. There was once this man. He was named Plinius the Elder, and he bothered to travel all over the world, including the Netherlands, and he came to the part that wasn't part of the Roman Empire yet, as he was uh, trying to discover all the people that the Romans were had to conquer in order to conquer, you know, the world. And he came to the Netherlands and he met the Frisian people. And he's, he, we don't really know if he actually was uh, in the north of the Netherlands, that he actually saw it with his own eyes or that he heard the stories. But he described the north of the Netherlands, so the part where we live, Friesland, West Friesland, uh, and East Friesland, which is now part of Germany. And he said, In those climates a vast tract of land, invaded twice each day and each night by the overflowing waves of the ocean, opens a question that is eternally proposed to us by nature. Whether these regions are to be looked upon as belonging to the land, or whether as forming a portion of the sea. Now, Plinius, he wasn't a geologist, but he was very close to the truth. The Netherlands below one meter and a bay um, can be considered without meddling of humans as being a part of the vast North Sea Ocean. And Plinius, he apparently saw it with great clarity because, you know, he was referring to the tides that move in and out and... Um, of the land that resembles something like this and these are called the tidal marshes and a tidal marsh is essentially a piece of land that gets invaded by the sea twice a day and um, only at springtide will these marshes overflow so you know springtide happens uh, once every uh, once or twice every month once every month at least and um, then everything overflows. But, you know, as long as springtide isn't happening or there isn't a huge storm, it's dry enough for some animals to live and some plants to grow. This is basically uh, what a salt, salt water marsh or a tidal marsh looks like. You have the open ocean over here, and then this is the beginning of the land, and some water flows in regularly in the tidal channel, and there is some mud flats on each side, and there is some plants over here who like salt water. And you can put your sheep on those plants that like salt water. By the way, those are called halophytes in Dutch. Halophyten. Halo, you know, it's, it's, it's a video game, I know. But it's also, uh, you know, the word for, for um, um, if, if, an, if an animal likes, or, or sorry, a plant likes salt, you know, it's, it's called a halophyte, apparently. And so these, these plants they live are they're pioneer plants, and you can put your sheep on it, and those sheep will eat it, and then you can eat the sheep or the milk of the sheep, or you can you know use the manure of the sheep in a similar fashion that we saw on the sandy soils to make your land more fertile. And of course you have to be careful for, for spring tides and for for huge storms when all of this overflows and you know you don't want to drown. So what they did is they built Dikes. Here we see uh, the rhythm of the tides in a uh, in a um, tidal marsh. Normally, this is just a tidal creek, and at low water, you know, even that is pretty dry. And then high water normally leads over there. And then if there is a, a storm and high water, it comes over here. And if there's a spring tide, then everything will turn wet. So these these areas, they're very you know, moving to the rhythm of the tides, essentially. And this is what Plinius saw. 
he also described the people, that's us, the, the Dutch people or the Frisians, as they, they were called. He said, here a wretched race is found, inhabiting either the more elevated spots of land or else a menaces artificially constructed and of a height to which they know by experience that the highest tides will never reach. He described them, you know, this was a man who came from Rome, the center of civilization. He was of good stock, a good family, so he was used to a certain amount of luxury. And he saw people living in farms surrounded by the ocean, you know, not having much money or not having much luxury, pretty hard lives in the north of the Netherlands, you know, fishing, uh, maybe some livestock farming, maybe some normal farming. And this guy, he saw them as wretched people. They had a tough life and uh, nothing close to, to what he was used to. Now here, this is an artist impression. Here you see, you know, this is apparently now there's low water. This is a glow. This is a, t this is a tidal creek. And then, you know, this is the Kvelder or the Tidal Marsh. And then, you know, there's some animals living here. And then, of course, if it was a very, very big storm, everybody, you know, lived over there. And then the water came, came here and they were dry. Cool. Now, the Dutch word for this is um, terpen, which comes from Fries. And in uh, uh, Groningen, they are called Wierden. So you come across Vierde as well and Terp, they are the same thing. They are an artificially made hill in a landscape. Some of them still exist. Uh, most of them, by the way, have been dug out. And um, remember the sandy soils that was very infertile? Well, a lot of these Terps were very fertile because they were made of sheep manure and um, litter from the house like, uh, I don't know, uh, beans that nobody ate. And I just threw them on a hill and then they built their house on top of that. So these, these turps were very fertile. And in, in Drenthe, you know, these lands, they had to be um, made more fertile. And so they dug out a turp, which wasn't necessary anymore because the sea isn't here anymore because we have dikes now. And, you know, these, a lot of these turps have been moved out. Sometimes turps are very, very big. In fact, you have a complete village here on a turp. So it's not just for individual houses, it's also for entire villages. And this is how it works, basically. Um, you have two houses here, and they start elevating themselves in, in the landscape. And this is just an individual house on a turp. It's called a house turp. Makes sense, right? And then after a while, you know, these turps become so big and so high that they connect. And now these two houses have become a village turp. This is how it goes. This is how easy it is. Um, the, this house is old. This house is old. These houses are relatively new, built when the village turp was created. Obviously, uh, this takes a lot of time. And the oldest turps that are found are as are closest to Germany and some of them are buried under a lot of big layers of new deposition because they were just left behind there's a figure 15 in your book and it shows that you know pretty pretty well the oldest turps are all the way near the Pleistocene subsurface near Germany and then they just moved in towards what is now the dunes and the, and the mud flats and the sea and so the Turp of Marne is one of the oldest ones. And, uh, you know, the Paddepool is completely buried. And uh, so is Hatsum. And th those Turps have, are, are now gone. Those are the old Turps. And, you know, the, the biggest Turps are the newest. And they are closest to what is now the sea. Here we have a map of Friesland. Now, mind you that this, of course, isn't here anymore. It's called the Middle Sea. And it's completely gone because, you know, the Netherlands changes. This is this has now been been polarized by the Dutch because, you know, we like we like land. So we make we make our own. And most of these um, Terps are obviously on, on Westerho and Eastergo has got some as well. And of course, this is 
the Vierde from Groningen. And they, they continue all the way into Germany. <coughs> and, you know, the, this was Piet Drachte, so no trips there. Because no tides, basically. All right. This is this is uh, how these turps looked uh, in uh, a thousand years ago, roughly around a thousand years uh, after our savior was born. And these these turps, some of them are village turps, some of them are individual turps. And th those guys were living there, and you know they thought mm, there must be an easier way to make a living here. And so these guys, they went over to those guys and they said, hey, how about we build a dike here that protects these lands? And so they build a dike. And then those guys, they came over to these guys and they said, hey, that's a good idea. Can we join in? Sure. And then they build a dike. And now all of this was protected. And so eventually the Frisian people, they started to build a lot of dikes that started around 1,000 years ago. Why? Because you need a lot of people to build a dike and you need organization. If you are too busy surviving, then, you know, it's not going to happen because you don't simply don't have the time to build one. Now, if there are enough people, if the population densities are high enough, and if there is enough organization possible, then you can start building these dikes. And this all happened around 1000 years ago, around the, the year 1000. And one of the oldest and biggest completely closed sea dikes is our own West Friese Umring dike, which is something to be very proud of if you're living in, you know, the west of the Netherlands like I do. Anyway, what, what happens when you build a dike is that every time the sea comes in, in a flood, it leaves a little bit of uh, marine deposits, like, you know, clays and sands, etc., and if you build, as soon as you build a dike, then the deposition in this area of new sand and clays, that stops because, you know, sea doesn't reach it anymore. Deposition continues on this side of the dike. So water moves into the dike, drops a little bit of sand and clay, and goes back again, new flood again and again and again. So this deposition stops over here. Nothing happens anymore because there's a dike in the way. Over here, it goes on. So this land is becoming higher. And only after a couple of times, people they realize that there is a lot more fertile land in front of the dike. And so they want to build another dike, maybe over there. And then they claim this bit. Now, if you take a look at this uh, map of sint Annapurochie in Friesland, you can see that there are a lot of dikes in this land. How many former sea dikes do you spot in this satellite picture? I, you know, I advise you to stop the video, watch this for, for a second, and see how many, how many dikes do you see in the landscape? Okay, so assuming you stopped the video and, t and, and, and taken a, a look at it, well, here they are. This is the first one. Now, deposition stops on this side of the dike. Deposition continues, though, and this becomes high enough, so they build a new dike, which is over there. Then the deposition stops here, but the deposition continues over at this side. So this becomes high enough. And then they build a new dike. So they claim this land from the sea. And then the deposition stops, but continues on this side of the dike. And so they build another dike. And so there is no, there is one, two, three, four dikes in this landscape. Nowadays, this, um, this uh, you know, claiming land by building a new dike, that is forbidden because the Wadersee is UNESCO World Heritage and you can't, you know, you, if, if they continue doing this, eventually the entire Wadersee would be gone and the, the, the islands wouldn't be islands anymore because we would have claimed all the land. So we don't want that because it's World Heritage, so it's forbidden to do this now. But for thousands of years, they did this. And um, what happens is something very peculiar. Because if I start looking at the altitudes of the land, so how high is this in conjunction or in relation to the sea? Well, it's only half a meter higher than the sea. 
And this area is it, it has had a little bit more deposition than this area. So it's a tiny bit higher. A little bit more sand and clays have been put down. And so it's a slightly bit higher than this. And this, for a reasonably long time, deposition went on. So again, this is slightly higher than this. And this is slightly higher than that because deposition went on for a very long time. And the longest period of time where deposition went on is actually this. So over there, this land is actually one meter and higher than this, where the shortest period of deposition is. So what we are seeing is that something very crazy going on because our instinct tells us that the sea is the lowest and then the further you go away from the sea, the higher it gets. Well, in Friesland, it's crazy, but it's the other way around. Sea is still going to be the lowest point, but the closer you get to the sea, the longer deposition has been going on, and so the higher the land is. This is crazy. This is contraintuitive. We don't realize this, but this land over here is actually the highest land in relation to the sea. And this land is actually the lowest. As a result of, you know, the building of new dikes and the taking of new land, what you'll notice is that the parcellation of the land is very long. Yeah, you have these rectangular shapes in the landscape, starting from the dike and moving into, you know, the newly reclaimed land. And or claimed land because you know it was the sea and now it's and now it's ours. So the reason for this is the so-called right of extension in Dutch. The het recht van opstrek. There's really not a good translation for this because it's typically Dutch. And what you have is you have a farm over here, an old farm, and you build a new dike. There's a lot of new land, and what this farmer is allowed to do is just extend his land directly beyond his farm and so here again he can extend his land directly after where his farm is so this is why in the north of the Netherlands you see these really rectangular shapes in the landscape as a result of the right of extension the recht van opstrekt